Hello, and welcome to the ELECTS webinar, Considering Leadership. I'm Lisa Lorenzo, a member of the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee. I will be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is MJ Tui. MJ is the Associate Vice President, Academic Affairs and Executive Director of the Health Sciences and Human Services Library at the University of Maryland, where she has worked in various library positions since 1986. She is also the principal investigator for the five-year cooperative agreement with the National Library of Medicine at the National Institutes of Health, which funds the National Network of Libraries of Medicine, Southeastern Atlantic Regional Medical Library, and National Docline Coordination Office. She serves as director of both programs. She received her MLS from the University of Pittsburgh and her BS degree in education from Clarion State University. She teaches an MLA CME course entitled Leadership Considered, Refining and Defining Your Skills for Today and Tomorrow, and co-teaches an MLA CME course, Do You Want to Be a Library Director? She currently serves on the MLA slash AAHL Joint Legislative Tax Task Force. She is active in the University System of Maryland and Affiliated Institutions Council of Library Directors, where she serves on the Executive Committee. She also serves or has served on numerous committees and task forces at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. She is also the co-author or author of over 200 chapters, articles, presentations, or posters. Her professional interests include leadership, emerging trends, library innovation and design, ethics, and mentoring. She brings much expertise to today's topic, and we are very fortunate to have her with us today. So just a few brief logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise, and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is ALCTSCE. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for our presenter, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slide shortly after the presentation concludes. And now here is MJ. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. All good? All good. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction, Lisa. I am delighted to be here. Um, uh, it, it's wonderful to hear all the things that uh, I think I've done, but um, uh, it's uh, always interesting to rehear them because, you know, that reflects a long, long lifetime in libraries. But anyway, I'm honored to be here this afternoon working with Alex. And uh, the thing is that's interesting to me is I usually do this live. Um, as a person who really scales over to the extrovert end of the old Myers-Briggs scale a lot, I love interacting with the audience. And so when I do presentations, I really enjoy getting visual cues like, laughing, groaning, etc. you know, in my attempts at humor or my, what I think are meaningful points that I make. Um, so, uh, although I don't want to waste any chat room or anything like that, if, if you have something and if you're so moved, you can enter a smiley face or a ha-ha or applause or even groan if necessary. Um, I Hopefully, we're going to have a great time going over this afternoon. Some of the things that I have been learning, studying, and doing in the area of, you know, leadership. And um, hopefully, we'll share some things that are meaningful for you. So, let's get started. This is me, um, and so I am the person behind the curtain, or the webinar, so to speak. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself, more than not much more than you've already heard, but I've been at the University of Maryland, Baltimore for 33 years in various capacities. I started out leading the education department. Um, my interest in leadership has really grown over the last couple years. Um, people ask me, how did you get interested in this whole leadership thing? And, and it's because, as with so many of us, I've had many, many opportunities to chair committees or, you know, as soon as you are in a member of a professional organization, as I'm sure you all know, um, immediately uh, you get volunteered for a lot of stuff. And before you know it, you could be the chair of a committee or the chair of a section or the chair of anything because you're a live, warm body. Um, so I've had many, many different opportunities to do that. So my, my interest, though, was, you know, I've been the president of the Medical Library Association. I've been the president of the Association of Academic Health Sciences Libraries. Um, I've had many opportunities here at the university to, to chair committees and to serve on committees. But I started to ask myself a few years back, and I'll explain what caused that, did I really do it well? Um, you know, leadership is more than just 
uh, heading a committee or getting you know appointed to something it, it has to do with actually getting things done inspiring people and making sure that I feel that making sure that their experience is a good one and that they, they feel like they've learned something I've learned something and we've accomplished something together so the, the, the turning point for me actually was in the year 2016, I was selected to be the Janet Doe Lecturer for the Medical Library Association, which is one of their highest honors. And what they do is they ask, it's kind of a free reign. You get to speak for an hour about some topic having to do with medical libraries that you're interested in and fascinated by, et cetera. I think that they actually just ask people who have been around a long time. They say, oh, yeah, MJ's been here 30 years. Let's, let's give her the Janet Doe Lecture. She must have something to say. So I started to think about it, and these nagging questions had, you know, arisen, which I mentioned earlier, which is, you know, when, when I've led things, have I really done it well? Um, I've been the director of this library since uh, 2004. Um, I've, I've learned a tremendous amount doing that, but, you know, did I do it well? And what does it mean to do it well? What does it mean to do it thoughtfully? What does it mean to really, really engage with the idea of leadership? So one of the things I'll tell you, for those of you that are younger members of our audience, is one of the things you'll discover when you've been around as long as I have is that, you know, when you're, when you're a young librarian, you're busy establishing yourself, learning your, you know, specific areas, um, you know, doing things that kind of end up, uh, you know, advancing your career. Now, when you get to my age, you uh, start to think about to yourself and say, hmm, huh, I don't have to be on the desk anymore and I don't have to answer reference questions so whatever am I going to do with my time so you really start to think to yourself what would I enjoy doing and I found through the Janet Doe lecture and some of the things I learned there which I'll share with you uh, later on in the in the uh, webinar um, that I just really really enjoyed this whole idea of leadership so it is a rich area and I have learned that leadership is more than running an organization or running a meeting. And there's so much to learn and to be thoughtful about. And we really only have about 45 minutes today. Um, so we're going to get right to it. So our goals for today are to think a little bit about the difference between manage management and leadership to try to see some of the things that I've discovered um, the literature says are attributes of what future leaders need to look like. Um, think about personal leadership style, strengths, your opportunities. How do you get to those leadership opportunities? And, and then finally, let's, let's begin thinking about or advancing your leadership journey. For some of you, this is going to be a starting point. For those of you that are looking for the next step, this might provide some additional impetus or inspiration to move forward. For experienced leaders, maybe it'll give you new food for thought or rejuvenation, but it's a lot to think about. Some of you may just decide, nah, leadership isn't for me. As was mentioned in the introduction, I teach a class so called, uh, do you want to be a library director? And it's about a six hour class that I co-teach with two of my colleagues, two medical library colleagues. And I always have said that we really need to change the title and make it why do you want to be a library director? And so, um, you know, you may by the end of today say, whoa, this is, this is not something I'm really interested in. So we're going to take a look at all of those things. So let's start with that management and leadership thing. Um, uh, you'll find that I have some quotations interspersed throughout the uh, presentation. But our discussion begins by kind of looking at management and leadership, and they are actually very complementary systems. Uh, that they're, and they're not contradictory at all. It's see, just different ways of getting things done and uh, approaching things. Uh, and both are necessary, and both coexist in people. So it's not that leadership is better than management or managers or better than leaders. Um, they very, have, very much have their own special um, reasons for being. So let's take a look. So Grace Murray Hopper, who was the first U.S. Navy Rear Admiral, said, you manage things, you lead people. So let's take a look at maybe some comparisons here. You have managers and leaders. Okay, so managers typically are day-to-day -day operational people. They organize things. They perhaps budget things, they make sure things happen, they're operationally oriented and process focused. I mean, I can't even imagine getting through a day without having some component of that in my work. Leaders, which is what we're going to focus on today, 
are usually people that are thought to be visionary, strategic thinkers, aligners, motivate, motivators, and inspirers. Now, this is not to say, and again, we'll talk more about this as we get further into the webinar, this is not to say that leaders are all these people that are sitting on these high mountaintops at the top of the pyramid. These traits, both for managers and both for leaders, can exist at all levels of an organization. So they are both extremely necessary. And if I can find my button, there it is. Here we go. So, and Warren Bennis, who is highly revered as being an organizational consultant, author, and scholar, as I say there, said one way to differentiate is managers do things right. I'm assuming that he's thinking about the operational piece, and leaders do the right thing. I think this quote's a little bit skewed towards leaders, but you know, I like to use it because it does differentiate between the idea of the operational versus the uh, higher level thinking, the visionary type of thinking. And really what I have discovered over the last couple years is to lead is to really acknowledge what you don't know. And this was a quote I heard at a meeting uh, and I then went and read the article um, in the Harvard Business Review and you can look this up. Uh, Jeffrey Garrett, who's the Dean of the Wharton School of Business, uh, I heard uh, he actually said this on September 16th, 2016. And this is so true. Becoming a leader is, is a journey. And so how do you find out what you don't know? I truly believe that you can learn to be a leader. And the reason I believe that is because there are estimates that as much as $50 billion was spent in 2017 on leadership training. Well, leadership training. So that must mean that someone some there, somewhere is thinking that you can be trained to be a leader. Either that or they've managed to convince us all and they're very rich. Um, but anyway, that's one of the estimates that I saw. So it's possible to become a student of leadership, but learning to be a leader should be intentional. You should approach it as you would approach anything that you're interested in, that you want to take that deep dive, that you don't want to just read a couple articles and say, okay, I'm a leader. So how do you become a student of leadership? Well, if I had you face to face with me, what we would do is we would take about five minutes and I would ask you to either work within a small group or work face to face to identify qualities of good leaders. So while we're sitting here kind of all listening to me, um, think about that to yourself. You know, what? think of the good leaders that you've known. Um, think of the bad leaders you've known because you can learn as much from the bad leaders as you can from the good leaders, and identify some of the qualities that you think have made the people that you think are good leaders, good leaders. You know, what, what did you admire about them? And, you know, just while you're sitting there, if you have a chance, write it down. Just see if I hit upon some of these as we go through the rest of the day. Um, so I suspect that you would probably have named things like honesty and openness, perhaps somebody who's a good communicator, uh, somebody who might be a visionary, somebody who is respectful of people, who takes other people's uh, you know, th uh, uh, feelings into account. I'm sure there are a number of things. I, I mean, it, usually, when, again, when I do this face-to-face, -face, um, I end up with 50 different types of qualities because we all know what we would like to see in a leader, and we also know what we don't like in leaders. And so as we go through, again, the webinar and as you go through your own leadership journey and learning, think about the things that are important to you and think about how you can accomplish those in your life. So you have to learn from studying, from reading, from your own experiences, situations, different opportunities you've had, and introspection and self-reflection. I found that you really need to think about what your motivation is to become a leader or to, to have some sort of leadership skills. Did someone tell you you should be a leader? Um, do you want to make more money if you're thinking that leadership uh, goes up the the uh, leadership pyramid and at the very top there, that's where you know that's what your that's what your aim is? And are you really really truly interested in in being a person who actually motivates, inspires, works with, and um, you know moves the idea of being a leader forward? So some of the things I don't want you to dwell on today, 
Um, and I sometimes call these in some of the other classes I teach the three myths of leadership. I don't want you to dwell on the fact that there are natural leadership abilities and people have to have charisma. Um, successful leaders are more likely to be considered successful because they were successful and it became known. You know, nothing breeds success like success. Don't dwell on the idea of whether you need to be an extrovert or an introvert. There are effective leaders in all areas uh, and everywhere on the extroversion to introversion scale. Um, and don't think about, don't dwell on the leadership food chain and your place in the universe. And the reason I say that is because there are only so many places at the proverbial top. And if you're a serious student of leadership and are intentional about leadership, you need to find other opportunities to grow and develop. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. So let's go to, um, I, well, I want to, let me see, I'll go back here, to the uh, charisma piece. Because one of the stories I tell, and it's getting to be more and more irrelevant, is the story of Winston Churchill, who, if you had been in England in the 1920s, 30s, the teens, you would have discounted him as being just a failure. So his natural leadership ability and his quote-unquote charisma was really brought out, was really supported by the whole World War, entry into World War II and leading England through World War II, you know, with his blood, his sweat, and his tears. Um, and sometimes, as I said earlier, leadership abilities come popping out when they're most needed. And in someone like Winston Churchill's case, after the war, he was not elected to be prime minister anymore. And he kind of went back to his estate, did a little bit of work, and ended up painting a lot. Um, but he really, in the crucible of World War II, his natural leadership abilities really came out to lead that country. So as you saw from my preview there, we were going to talk about a comparison of extroverted and introverted leaders. This is fascinating to me. And I'll tell you a story about that in that extroverts typically have a breadth of knowledge and influence. They're, they're wide. They're wide thinkers. They are kind of, uh, uh, it, they definitely enjoy frequent interactions and they recharge by being with people. And that goes back to, I think, my earlier comment, which said, I can't see you out there. And so I don't know if I'm, you know, if I'm connecting with you or not. So, you know, I definitely feel that among, you know, in myself. Um, but introverts have a depth of knowledge and influence. They have what I would call substantial interactions, and they recharge by spending time alone. Both introverts and extroverts can be excellent, excellent leaders. And the story that I'll share with you is that one of uh, the people that's on our leadership team here in the library has been for a couple of years studying the whole concept of the introverted leader and has shared many things with me in terms of how introverted leaders can really be successful. Uh, if you are more interested in the topic, there's a book called The Introverted Leader, Building on Your Quiet Strength by, I think it's Jennifer Conweiler, K-A-H-N-W-E-I-L-E-R. Anyway, the person that's in my group has introduced me to the idea that an introvert needs to be well prepared for meetings, um, but can also provide an incredible insight and very deep as I say, the depth of knowledge here into situations. Sometimes I might not get an answer from the introverts on the team here right away, but they'll come back to me with really great ideas later. So don't ever believe that if you think of yourself as an introvert, that you cannot be an effective leader. And it's something that um, in many cases is really, really prized in terms of the abilities that you bring to the table. But what I would really like to talk about is the ambivert. And people laugh when I use the term ambivert because, ha, 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 that must be something she made up. No, it's not. Uh, actually, it's been a psychological term, I think, since I think the 1920s. And it's a person who falls in between the extrovert and introvert. Now, this can be a natural personality trait or it can also be um, something situational that changes with the situation. It's a person who exhibits traits of both the extrovert and the introvert, and it depends. You know, sometimes, let's think about this, we're sitting at a table with, in a committee meeting or something, you know, that we're, we have to be at, and you just sit there quietly. Even, even extroverts, you know, like myself, I know I've sat at meetings quietly because 
it's more important for me to listen at that time and take in what's being said before I can even share um, what I think about a situation. Um, an ambivert can be task-oriented, task -oriented, but based on the situation or the need at the time. And so you get a comfort level with the situation that's going on. And an ambivert is actually a very, very healthy um, personality to exhibit, especially in groups and especially when you need to lead people that you need to listen to and talk to it, you know, equally. Uh, I have a citation for an article that's uh, a lot of, uh, there's some really funny ones that you can read, but this one is semi, it's, it's serious. Nine Signs You're an Ambivert that appeared, uh, was written by Bradbury, appeared in Forbes magazine in uh, April 26, 2016. Um, there are some also really uh, funny things when you Google them that are uh, uh, signs that you may truly be an extrovert or you may truly be an ambivert. So um, I, if you're interested in this, study this a little further, and it's, it's certainly something to cultivate and something that I'm aware of, um, even though when I'm doing personal interactions, uh, I tend to be more extroverted. I do know that there are situations where I can really, and, I, and actually I prefer to be in the middle, you know, somebody that gives and takes at the same time. So let's move on to one of my favorite things. Um, this is probably, as we've been getting into this, almost the most important message of today. Um, really, there, if, if, if this doesn't resonate with you, maybe there's no point in the rest of my discussion today. And the myth is that all leaders are at the top. When I was doing my preparation for the Janet Doe lecture, I looked at probably over 40 TEDx and TED videos in preparation, just to see what was being said, and plus, you know, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes at a time were achievable for me. Um, and I came across one that has continued to have an impact on my life, um, even you know, three years, four years later. And it was done by a gentleman named Drew Dudley. And Drew Dudley is a um, education, um, a leadership educator. He's from Canada. And um, I'm going to read this quote to you because, it, as I said, it, it meant a lot to me. Okay, let's get started with that. And it was in a TED Talk called Everyday Leadership. And so that you'll be able to find it. Um, and I'm going to quote Drew. And it say, he says, how many of you are uncomfortable with calling yourself leaders? We don't let ourselves take credit for it, treating it as if, as if it was something someday we may deserve. And I've come to realize that we've made leadership into something bigger than us. We've made it into something beyond us. We've made it about changing the world. And we've taken this title of leader and we treat it as if it's something that one day we're going to deserve. But to give it to ourselves right now means a level of arrogance or cockiness that we're not comfortable with. So, and I'll continue with his quote, we've made leadership about changing the world and there is no world. There's only six billion understandings of it, and if you change one person's understanding of it, one person's understanding of what they're capable of, one person's understanding of how much people care about them, one person's understanding of how powerful an agent for change they can be in this world, you've changed the whole thing. And if we can understand leadership like that, if we can redefine leadership like that, I think we can change everything. So part of his talk, kind of tells us he's calling on us to celebrate leadership as an everyday act of improving each other's lives, which is why I say you don't need to be at the top of the food chain. And um, I'm glad I had an opportunity to share that with you because if you have a chance, watch the whole TEDx talk from TEDx Toronto. Um, it's, it's, it's actually kind of funny in some parts of it too. And I'll just leave you with the thought that people lead every day who are not called leaders. Everyone can be a leader, and you lead in different ways at different times. And sometimes you step up in your leader, and sometimes you sit back and let somebody else lead. But we all have that possibility, that capability. And we have opportunities every single day, whether we're having a conversation around the hallway, uh, whether we're attending a meeting, um, whether we're sitting on a project, we don't even have to be leading a project, on committees, personal interactions, we have to be able, and we are able, and it's imperative for us to be able to lead up and down and sideways. So leadership can occur in 
the smallest of settings with two people. Leadership can occur in a big setting, talking to 2,500 people. Um, but you have to embrace the idea that you can get leadership experience and you can become a leader every day, every day. So the next piece I'd like to move to um, are talking about some of the things that are essential traits for um, future leaders. And this comes from my research from the Janet Doe Lecture. And what I wanted to do was kind of see, as we in, end up in this um, uh, multi-global connected world, what are the types of traits future leaders going to need to have? Um, and many of them are traits you know, that have been around for a long, long time. But these were traits that, again, in the research that I did, and um, I'll tell you what research I did, um, came up as things that we felt really should be focused on, or I felt really should be focused on. So what I did was, when I was preparing the, the Doe lecture, was I did a text analysis of the all the MLA leaders of the past, Medical Library Association leaders of the past, using text analysis software, to see if there were words in articles about them, you know, describing what they, why they were good leaders, uh, in their presidential profiles, etc., that popped out. What were things that repeated over and over and over again? So that was one thing I did. Um, I, at the time, did the interviews with current Medical Library Association leaders, the board of directors, the president, the executive directors, and asked them about the kind of things that they thought would be essential traits for future leaders. And of course, I matched the two of those up. And finally, I did some readings because that you get a lot of good information out of readings to see if there was anything that was actually in the literature that talked about what some of these essential traits would be. So what I discovered were this set of traits. One, risk takers. So risk taking isn't actually a leadership trait as much as it is a process. Um, it's a process where we, that we need to get comfortable with according to the literature. We need to when I talk about a process, I mean that risk takers actually pour over details, they study situations, they may do it very quickly, but they identify and know the challenges and possible outcomes of the risks they're taking. Um, and so that's an important quality for us to think about as we move in our library world, you know, when we think about change and, and, and the kind of things that we're going to be facing uh, in this very, very swiftly moving information age. Um, then the next piece was innovation or innovators. And innovators simply look at new oppor at opportunities in new and different ways and find new solutions. And, you know, again, we make this, uh, this is another one of those words that we, we've made into this big word, like leader, but this person is an innovator and you're always looking for this big idea. Sometimes it's just doing an old thing in a new way that takes you to another level. So don't think of innovation as, you know, inventing the Tesla. You know, think of innovation as being finding a new way to do some sort of process or a new uh, way to, to look at a problem. Disruptors. And I think disruptors are my favorite um, because it kind of makes me feel like an anarchist. But we need to embrace and accept and cause disruption. All disruption does is simply create a new normal. So a person who is a leader and a disruptor need to pursue the truth, be willing to guide others through chaos. And heaven knows, I, I don't know anybody that might be in the audience today that hasn't experienced chaos sometime in the last few years. We need to make decisions and then break the rules and write new ones. I can't think of anything that might be more useful, again, as we move forward in a world where um, things change daily to be able to embrace that chaos and make some sense out of it. And we have to be able to thrive on uncertainty. Failure tolerance. This is tough. Nobody likes to fail and nobody likes to admit they failed. But um, it doesn't mean when you fail, you quit. It means that if you're failure tolerant, you need to reassess and then recalibrate. You might fall down seven times, but you get up eight. 
resilience. And a lot's been in the literature lately about resilience, and I know a lot of books are out there about it. One of the ones that I enjoyed, again, as I was preparing my lecture, was one by a gentleman named Andrew Zoli, who is a futurist. And uh, his book is entitled Resilience, Why Things Bounce Back. And he defines resilience as the capacity of a system, an enterprise, or a person to maintain its core purpose and integrity in the face of dramatically changed circumstances. And for whatever reason, when I saw that definition, I thought of it fits within libraries perfectly. We do have, you know, we're, we're trusted, we're looked up to, we're socially conscious, we have a core purpose, and we have integrity based on what our users think of us. So how do we become resilient as we go through a lot of changes? And then the next one is, a, is a, two words I kind of laugh at because in some of the literature it's called empathetic and in other parts of the literature it's empathic. And that's to be able to understand another person's viewpoint and to put yourself in someone else's shoes. A lot of times people confuse empathy with sympathy. Sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody. Empathy is actually being able to understand and feel the emotions or be able to understand a person's viewpoint. So that's um, something that, that's, that's um, listed as one of the things that's um, important. Strong support networks. And I put this in here because even though it wasn't mentioned as strong support networks per se, we all need to have families, friends, mentors, colleagues, people you can bounce ideas, off of people you can go to when you haven't had a good day, people who understand what you're talking about. I have a number of people in the Medical Library Association, and I've coined a word that I'm hoping kind of catches on everywhere in the entire universe that are what I call frolics, friend colleagues. And I think some of my medical library friends are in on this webinar today. But um, so the frolics, these are people who, they're your friends, they're your colleagues, you see them at annual meetings. Um, I have a number of them that I can sit down with and, and have an adult beverage or, or not um, and sit down with and they will totally understand what I'm going through. Um, they'll totally understand the issues that we're facing. They're a support network. But also part of this is just healthy living. You know, you've got to take care of yourself both mentally and physically and emotionally. And so this is really important. You know, you need to be able to say, yeah, there's somewhere else that means something to me than my work. Um, and that was one of the things I discovered that was kind of a difference between what I would call the old school medical library people and, you know, the ones that I historically have looked up to, like Janet Doe, who the next lecture was named for, um, and some of the other ones, is that they really lived to work and didn't necessarily work to live. Um, and I've seen a real change, um, you know, myself, even myself included, and some of our younger members of our team. Um, and it's just really important that you have somewhere else to go when you close that door behind you. And then effective communicators across all modes. And so what that means is not only do you have to be able to um, speak, but you have to be able to write. You have to be able to use different types of media to communicate, whether it's, you know, something like uh, Twitter or if it's Facebook or whatever it is. You have to understand how to be a good communicator. However, I think the most important part of being a good communicator is being a good listener. And that's something that I work on all the time. Um, that's one of the key things that I have in terms of when I think about essential traits for future leaders and I'm still on a journey, I think about listening. And, and you know, the thing is you don't have to master all of these things. When I'm telling you this, you're saying, holy smokes, I want to be a leader. They've given me all these things I have to work on. Pick a couple of them that resonate with you and, and think of ways that either you could improve it or you could, you say, hey, I do that pretty well. I could do that, you know, even better. Now, two things that I didn't put on this slide that came out, um, and I truly believe in them, uh, two things that future leaders are going to need to have are a sense of humor, because there's so much funny stuff just that goes on daily. And if you can't laugh at what's going on or even laugh at yourself, uh, sometimes I laugh at myself when I get kind of high-handed and I say, oh, my gosh, don't take her seriously. Um, but, you know, 
humor is really, really something. And um, I'm trying to remember the quote, uh, he who can laugh at himself will never cease to be amused. Um, that's something I think about. And then the other thing is stamina. And uh, that kind of goes back to that, that, that uh, holistic, healthy feeling, taking care of yourself, those strong support networks. Because there are days when being a leader, no matter where, in, where you are in your leadership journey, can be absolutely fatiguing. You, you know, using your brain a lot is, is hard. Leaving people is hard. Running meetings is hard. Trying to get points across, it's hard work. So you have to have stamina. And so that goes back to healthy eating, healthy living, and those support networks. So this is something. This is You guys are the first ones to hear me talk about this. But this year, I am, for the second time, a mentor in the OZL Leadership Fellowship. And so I am a mentor, and I have a fellow. And at our first meeting of the fellowship group, which was back in November, I was introduced to this article uh, by Sue that says you don't just need one leadership voice, you need many. Um, and this just really, really resonated with me about the many different types of voices leaders need to have. And it's they're not necessarily physical voices, but they're some of them are attitudes. Um, and, and you need to develop these leadership voices, many different parts of your leadership voice, beyond sounding confident or just having volume in a meeting. Um, it's, it's sometimes how you choose to act. So when you think about your voice of character, think about who you choose to be. What's your moral anchor? What about civility and respect? How do you wish people to think about you in terms of uh, your character? Your voice of context. So seeing your role in the bigger construct and being able to kind of set the stage, um, uh, be able to insert your expertise, and be able to frame things in, in, in a way that you know, it's understandable, which leads you to the next one, which is your voice of clarity. So many times leaders, again, at whatever level, wherever they are, have got to distill the information that is just bombarding them in order to move an organization, a committee, um, a process forward. And some of that means being able to cut quickly or easily to voice the clarity of the situation, to strip away the noise from a situation and help prioritize things. Your voice of curiosity, you know, that's a really kind of a fun one. And it's one we, you know, again, as a leader, sometimes leaders think, well, I have to know all the answers um, because that's, that's what leaders do. Well, that's not true. Sometimes it's important, in, important to engage with different perspectives uh, and receive, you know, receiving challenges to understand where things are coming from. If someone disagrees with you, the question isn't when you're a leader, no, that's not right. I'm the leader and I say so. The question is, why do you think that way and what is the... What's, what's, what's behind what you're talking about? Developing that voice of curiosity is really important. And finally, your voice of connection. Um, and this is something I know the, the folks here at the library hear a lot from me, which is we have to become storytellers. We have to find the ways to link with our user communities, our administrations, um, anybody we're talking to. We have to be able to tell our story and make sure that we connect with people because um, if you can't have that human connection, uh, and sometimes I, I think that about email, for example, it's so much easier for me to just email the person in the office next to me than go walk over and talk to them. But just think of the importance of actually being present for a person and thanking them and acknowledging them for contributions. This is really the social aspects of leadership. And I'm studying more and more about this. There's a book that Sue has written as well that I have not yet acquired, but, but I plan on getting it and, and trying to understand a little bit more about this. Another consideration, and I'm sure you've all seen this, Peter Drucker says, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think what that means is that you know a culture is the values and behaviors of your unique environment, of your library, of your department, of your committee, of whatever. Um, sometimes they're social, sometimes they're traditional, sometimes they're psychological, sometimes they're long-standing assumptions. And you can come up with strategic plans and strategies for doing things until the cows come home. But if it isn't what is comfortable within your culture, then it's not going to work. 
So being tuned into the culture of your institution, being tuned into the culture of your library, being tuned into the culture of your organization um, is a really important part of getting comfortable with that whole leadership idea. So think of it as institutional thinking and analysis um, and spend time thinking about culture. What is the culture of your library? What's the culture of your institution? What's the culture of your professional organization? What do people value? What do you value? And what makes them want to get up and come to work every day? We're doing some work here um, in January um, around the idea of how people like to be appreciated. And I think that's all part of building our culture. And so I think this is, a, this is something that we, we often take for granted, but we need to make sure we understand it so we can move our institutions, um, our committees, whatever, forward. So where do you get leadership opportunities? Well, I'm sure I'm giving you a list that you have already thought about and opportunities you've already taken, but you certainly get them in your job whether you're in a department, but you could get them from projects, from committees. Professional organizations, as I said, boy, in a professional organization, all you have to do is volunteer to be on a committee, and within a year, you're the chair of the committee. Um, there are affinity groups, you know, things like sororities, um, organizations, um, you know, out in the community, volunteering places. You can get lots of leadership opportunities there. And churches and community groups. And these are just, I'm sure you can think of tons of other ones. But sometimes we, tend to center our leadership thinking about the work we do and that's what we value but there is a lot of valuable leader there are a lot of valuable leadership opportunities outside of just that 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 place that we call home every day for you know eight hours ten hours I hope not more than ten hours does that include lunch I don't know um, how do you build your capacity as a leader and these are actually things that you can do when we finish this um, today this is actually very intentional work, and this is something I would really recommend you do. Okay, first of all, you need to assess your strengths and weaknesses, but I'm going to tell you something. It's so much easier for human beings to write down their weaknesses than it is for them to write down their strengths. So for every weakness, I want you to promise me that you are going to list one of your strengths and take a look at those essential traits of future leaders, because I bet you model some of those already. But do that assessment. And again, you are not allowed. Of course, I don't know how I'll ever know, because you'll be doing this in the privacy of your offices or cubes or whatever. Um, but I want you to promise me that for every weakness, you list a strength. You know? Set goals for yourself. And by setting goals for yourself, that means that you are going to actually try to do something different. You're going to try to do some things that, that help you move along your path to, do, to, to becoming a leader. And you seek out opportunities to lead, uh, that whole volunteerism thing. Um, then afterwards, evaluate your success, because I know you're going to be successful. If you do this intentionally, and if you do this with the thought, I want to be a good leader. What do I need to do to do this well? I understand the culture. I understand the people who are around the table. I know all these things. Um, evaluate your success because it's going to be a success and um, look at it and say again what what did I do really well what maybe could I have done better where do I need to grow to do this better and and seek out those opportunities to lead and if you do that it becomes more and more natural with every time you have an opportunity okay do something that is hard I hate budgets and I do some every year I have to do a budget and every year I have to do projections they never give me any more money I don't know why I have to do it but um, I, for me that is hard because I so believe that the library is so central to all the success that happens at the University of Maryland Baltimore that it's very hard for me to describe and motivate other people to believe the way I do so <clears throat> I frequently get a little bit testy over having to do budgets and, you know, okay, numbers. My husband says budget is the B word at our house. Um, every time he brings it up, I kind of like, oh, change the subject. Isn't it time to do Christmas cards, dear? Um, and so do something that is hard. And what I usually do is I do that something that is hard first thing in the day when I'm fresh. Now, you may be a better afternoon person. Do it then if that's a better time for you. But set aside time and do something that's hard. And accept that failure is an option. Remember that fall down seven times, get up eight, because that's 
that's what you have to do. You have to work through failures. Sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to, as hard as that is for you to believe um, when in the moment. I find that I have gotten so much better about admitting when I'm wrong. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm taking a little sip of water here. And apologize if necessary. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, and that's really an important part of just being a mature adult. Leaders are not always right. And sometimes you make mistakes. And when you know you've made a mistake, you're a bigger person if you admit that you're wrong and apologize and then find a way to make it better. And then the last point here is one that I find to be interesting because it's kind of fallen out of the literature a little bit in terms of finding a, met a mentor. So one of the things I did was I took, took a look at what it means to have a mentor. Mentors can be formal or informal. The mentor should not be your boss. Um, and the reason for that is, and many people think, oh, I want my boss to be my mentor. should not be your boss because eventually you're going to be put in a situation with your boss where they're going to have to evaluate you or have some sort of constructive criticism for you. Find somebody else to be a mentor. This is an interactive relationship. Keep your mentor informed of what's going on with you. Um, always make sure that you are in contact with your mentor. Don't say, can you be my mentor? Meet with them for coffee and then have them, you know, have the whole relationship not even be no contact for months. So keep that mentor informed of what's going on, what's working you for you, what isn't. Be appreciative. Um, write a note to your mentor every now and then because they're expending social capital to keep you and help you along your way if they're willing to do this and willing to do it well. So don't be afraid to thank them. And you know, mentors come and mentors go. And if you feel like the mentoring relationship isn't working out anymore, don't be afraid to end it. Again, you're going to have informal mentors, people who are kind of going to guide you throughout your career. And you could have these very formal ones. And if you have a formal one that you feel isn't working out anymore, it's better to be honest and better to just end it. And we are going to quickly run, a time, run out of time. So we're getting down to our last couple slides. Your next steps. I want you to pay attention to your feelings about your leadership journey, because it is a journey. How do you feel it's going? What's your comfort level? Do some honest self-assessment. Maybe this isn't the right time for you to kind of make a big push towards working on your leadership skills and abilities. Um, but beyond your strengths and weaknesses, is leadership for you? Do you really want to be a leader? Are you willing to commit the intentional time? Because as I said earlier, it's important that you make a commitment to it. It's important to become a stu student, of yeah, student of leadership. Um, take another look at the attributes of the future leaders list. Does it make sense to you? Where do you fit in? Where could you focus and grow? What's an area for development? For example, how do you become a risk taker? And I don't mean we bungee jump off of bridges or anything. So what does leadership success look like to you? What is your long-term goal? How will you know you're a successful leader? You need to kind of have a thought in your mind that you're going to be successful if you are able to run committee meetings, do this, be effective here, influence things, make a short-term plan. A short-term plan might be tomorrow morning when I attend the such and such and such strategic planning meeting, I am going to make one comment about the strategic plan. That could be a short-term plan, a short-term goal. But make a long-term plan as well. Write these things down. I have found that if you write things down, like tomorrow I'm going to speak up at the meeting, you will do it. Make a long-term plan. Think about the kind of things you need to do um, outside of what you're doing and um, what the journey will look like to you. Where you need to get more information, where you need to step up a little bit, maybe where you need to step back a little bit. And when I say become a student of leadership, what I'm recommending here is look into things like leadership programs. They have them at Harvard. I mentioned the one at the Association of Academic Health Sciences Libraries. But I would strongly encourage you to read outside of the library literature. One of the things I most enjoy, and this is just my own personal enjoyment, is um, I subscribe to Fast Company, the magazine. And because of that, I get quick leadership reads every now and then that are like three-minute leadership reads that are usually focused on some leadership 
trait, like three leadership traits that will put you on the road to success, things like that. And I find that they're really helpful. I may laugh at them and say, ha, I don't believe that. Um, but, you know, it's something that, that causes me to think about leadership fairly regularly. Another thing that I've read that I also recommend highly, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with the Good to Great book by Jim Collins. What you may not be so familiar with is that he wrote another book called Good to Great in the Social Sectors. Um, and what that does is focuses on places that are not for profit. And what's more not for profit than a library? But um, it gives you a different look at how people value these nonprofit sectors and observe good and bad leaders. And then I have also started just recently to do a leadership journal, taking notes about things that I think um, I want to remember or go back to. And sometimes journaling, at least in our organization, I see a lot of people carrying around these little, the little journals and writing little things in them, you know, here and there or big thoughts. You could do it. Finally, before we finish up here, James Cousins and Barry Posner wrote in the five practices of exemplary leadership that ultimately it boils down to five different things. Modeling the way, inspiring a shared vision, challenging the process, enabling others to act. I always tell people I am the ultimate resource person in this library. My job is to make sure that the people who need to do things have the resources they need to get those things done and encourage the heart. And I, if you take those ideas, you can fit all the other things I've talked about in the last 45 minutes into one of these five kind of areas, these exemplary leadership things. So commit to something, some change, some action. Nothing's too big or small. It's sometimes baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. It's sometimes no steps until you're ready. Write it down and then make it happen. And finally, I like to leave people with a little bit of humor because I always tell people, well, you know, the biggest challenge for a leader is that you have to have followers. And so I leave you with Benjamin Hooks who said, if you think you're leading and turn around and see no one's following, then you are just taking a walk. Well, thank you. And um, I don't know if there'll be any questions, but I do have quickly before we get to questions to thank the elects webinar team who got me here today and helped support me in all my flurries of activities, the Health Sciences Human Services Library tech support team um, here at the library who made sure that my headset worked and that I had a new fancy schmancy headset. And finally, a person who I'm pretty sure is listening in here, I'd like to thank Maria Pincus, our metadata librarian, who persevered in getting me to present this webinar. Um, and I have to say that she was relentless and making sure that I offered this up. So thank you, Maria. I'm happy I did it. Okay, questions. <laughs> All right, thank you, MJ. Um, this has been really not only informative, but also inspirational, I would say. <laughs> so we do yeah. now have time for some questions. Um, and to our attendees, if you have not already done so, you can please go ahead and enter any questions you have into the questions box on your screen. Um, and then while we're waiting for those to come in, um, I'll ask a quick question of you. Um, sure. Do you have any advice about how to build those sort of strong support networks that you were talking about during your presentation? Wow, that's that's a really great question because some of them are natural because it could be your family. Um, you may already have friends. Um, I have actually, those strong support networks have come to the. I was thinking about a person who is one of my best friends who I met. Um, I had dinner with her the other night because we were both at the CNI meeting, um, and I met her, well, let's see, 33 years ago, and I walked into a professional meeting, a local professional meeting, and, you know, I'm probably, knowing me, made some sort of sarcastic comment or asked her questions about what she did, and we just hit it off. And a lot of times it's, um, uh, there's a lot of, um, uh, partnerships and frolics that are made under fire, you know, when you've suffered together over a committee or solving a problem. Um, but I think the more you work with people, the better your opportunity is to find those those support networks and to build those support networks. Um, you know, from the smallest thing like a book club uh, outside of the library to a book club in the library. I mean, there's you have to engage with people, which is one of the things, like I said, that worries me about email and a lot of um, doing things digitally. 
Um, sometimes you've just got to pick up the phone. Sometimes you have to walk into the office. Sometimes you have to have face-to-face -face meetings. You know, it's you never know when the opportunity is going to present itself, but it certainly doesn't present itself, like I said, through email or just doing things digitally. You know, be be present and be personal. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Um, mm -hmm. Still waiting. Um, there are still a few minutes if anyone has any questions, um, but I, I'll go ahead and ask one more since we have some sure, time. Sure, thank you. Yeah, uh, sure. Yeah, so I'm kind of thinking about some friends of mine who have um, maybe managers who are a little bit challenging to work with. So I wonder if you mm. have any advice too about how we can help others to become better leaders. Wow. So that's <laughs> that falls into a category I, uh, called that I that I have in in another pre the presentation. I think it's in the class that I do with two other people, and it's the the managing up kind of thing, um, or managing down, or managing sideways. Um, wow, that's a great question because we all we all have to report to somebody. I mean, we all. My boss is the provost, and I know who he has to report to, and he reports to the president who has to report to the chancellor, who has, you know, there's always somebody you have to report to. <clears throat> so in terms of, of managing up or helping others to become good leaders, um, one of the things that I always talk about is trying to find, figure out what are the stressors and pain points in their lives or in their work. You know, uh, it, some people are more willing to, to talk about that than others, but um, sometimes there are things going on that that people don't realize. You know, for example, I know I've I, I have said to a couple people here on occasion, if you only knew the things I can't tell you, <laughs> you know, because um, it's just other other work that's being done. But anyway, um, I digress. But you know, trying to understand their pain points, trying to figure out, you know, how you can help them. And also just modeling that good behavior yourself, um, you know, reiter, you know, restating questions, um, uh, making sure that you understand what's necessary, uh, offering to help some, you know, with some of the problems that you know, or some of the issues that may be going on. Um, I, but there are, I believe, some people whose behavior you just can't change um, unless they they can't change unless they want to change. But you can do the best. You can be the best person you can be, and I think it's just civility in some cases. Yes, thank you. All right, so we have a couple more questions. We'll have time to answer just one more. Um, okay. Um, so here, the first one that came in is: If you find yourself always leading from the back, never the front, how do you change that? If you find yourself leading from the back and never from the so, I'm assuming that the questioner wants to lead from the front. That's yeah. That's the, how I'm reading it as well. <laughs> that's okay. I'm I'm because you know I'm a firm believer that you can lead from the back very effectively. But if your goal is to lead from the front, so now I have to think that twist that in my head there a little bit, and think about if you want to lead from the front. One of the things that again I can only relate it to my actual experience here. Um, we have dialogues about um, conversations with leaders or with, you know, when, when when the direct reports that I have report to me, I ask them, what can I, what can we do to make your, what, what is it you would like to do? Where do you like to grow? How would you like to do more? I'm not sure if this person has that kind of, of relationship where they could say to the person that they report to, um, you know, I'd like to have more opportunities to lead groups or to take on more projects or to lead a project or to serve on a committee. Um, that, is, again, this is a conversational thing and these conversations aren't easy, but that's one way of making your interest and intention known. Um, and I think that's, it's a very honest thing too. You have to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. Kind of a, a light, lighter, lighter weight answer to the question than I would like to give, but I know that that's how it works here um, and if the person that they report to or the the leader that 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 or the opportunity that they would like to have more of um, isn't coming to them from the person who leads it oh, this, that was very convoluted oh, that's it's fine that's it's, perfect <laughs> yeah it's time to, it's time to have the conversation and say I would like to do more of this how can I do more where do you see me developing 
That's great. Thank you. Um, so we did have a couple more questions come in, and um, MJ did offer to answer those uh, after the presentation. So we will be able to send the answers to the remaining questions out via email. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, just to conclude, we are so glad all of you could be with us today. You will soon receive a short online evaluation form. Please do take a few minutes to respond to the questions if you're able. Your comments are very valuable and help the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee plan future events. The email will also include links to today's slides and recording. You now also have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance, and that information will also be in the email. So thank you again to our presenter, MJ Tui, and thanks also to the members of the Continuing Education Committee, Wanda Jazieri and Felicity Dykus, and to Megan Doherty from the ELECT's office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. As other continuing education events coming up, please see the ELECT's website to register or find more information on this and other upcoming webinars. And finally, ELECT also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will be on January 8th, discussing project management in libraries. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Thank you all for joining us today. This concludes our session.